tienen? Sí, sí. Vale. Ok. Buena tarde a tu Tom. La primera cosa que he de hacer es disculpar la presencia del director, en Josep Boya, que por cuestiones familiares eh, no ha podido no arribar, pero nos ha asegurado que vendrá un pel més tard. En todo caso, me toca a mí hacer una mica los parabéns a los parabéns a los eh, coeditores científicos y al conferenciante, a Jorge Jor Berke. Eh, bé, Um, cuando se va a plantear esta publicación, que yo soy fa una mica de temps, fa més d'un any que van començar a treballar, aquesta publicació va ser un, un, una de les dels primers encàrrecs que se em va realitzar a mi en aquesta casa, només a l'entrada, en aquesta casa, des de, de coordinar la publicació del segon workshop on Light Neolithic Ceramics in Ancient Mesopotamia, Pottery in Context. Eh, van començar a treballar per, 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 al voltant de fa un any, y de fet, eh, eh, esta publicación, eh, como ahora la hemos visto, no tiene un, bueno, no un formato diferente, es el mateix format que las altas monografías que edita el, el Museo de Arqueología de Cataluña, pero sí que han cambiado el formato del color, y si, si os fijáis, no posa monografías del MAC, del Museo de Olardula, o posa de las seus, de, de seus, sino posa monografías del MAC, monografías del MAC. Um, aquest és el primer número d'una nova sèrie de monografies que hem anomenat Monografies del MAC i és una, una nova sèrie que, actua, que, que ha optat aquest color lila diferent per la portada i vol ser una, eina, una, una nova eina editorial eh, per, donar, per donar servei i per donar sortida a diverses recerques, recerques d'alt nivell que es fan en el país i que no estaríem en mar d'altres de, 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 recerques que realitza de la mateixa institució. En aquest sentit, aquestes monografies del MAC el que volen fer són recollir doncs, recerques de primer nivell que es realitzen al, al país però que no estan lligades amb la recerca que fa el mateix museu ni a les mateixes col·leccions que, de, que, que, custodia, que custodia el museu. Eh, és la primera d'aquesta sèrie, eh, tractaran diverses temàtiques i de fet és, una primera, és un, primer, un, un primer llibre, una, el primer número i de fet el segon, el, en guany mateix, se complementarà un segon llibre que se presentarà el, que se presentarà el desembre, que és una monografia, una monografia que tindrà el nom Les Valls d'Andorra durant el Neolític, un encreuament eh, de camí eh, al centre dels Pirineus. I de fet, amb aquesta mateixa idea, i molts de vosaltres ja vau, vau, vau compartir, van compartir a la taula rodona del Neolític que es va realitzar a Girona el 6 d'abril d'aquest any, també entra dentro d'aquesta monografia i bé, un, vol ser una eina nova eh, que permeti donar sortida doncs, a recerques que es fan en el nostre país eh, de molt nivell com la, com la monografia que presentem avui al mateix. Re, yo només eh, agrair-vos la, la presencia, agrair als editors l'esforç que hem realitzat durant tota la confecció d'aquesta monografia. Si et sembla, dono pas a l'Anna, eh, que nos explicará. Muchas gracias, Toni. De fet, aquest és el segon congrés en estudi de la ceràmica antiga del Pròxim Orient. És el, el primer va tenir lloc a Breno, al gener, recordo que feia molt fred, estava tot nevat, gener del 2012, crec, si no... 13, doncs 2013, i eh, que evidentment va permetre ajuntar un grup d'investigadors que difícilment es poden trobar en un marc d'estudi de, i d'intercanvi de, de, de recerca, específic com és aquest, el de la ceràmica eh, del Pròxim Orient. En aquell cas, eh, el llibre i la publicació va acabar tenint lloc i és una publicació editada pel doctor Cruells, la Ina Matei Cucova i el, i el l'Olivier Niuen I uh, en el decurs d'aquesta preparació es va, es va fer evident que feia falta una segona, una continuïtat en, en aquestes trobades. Llavors l'oportunitat que ens va donar primer la Universitat Autònoma, en certa manera emparar-ho, que també ja havia evidentment afavorit el desenvolupament del primer i després el museu d'Arqueologia al MAC, eh, ens va portar a celebrar la, aquest segon, aquesta segona trobada a Empúries, per tant, un lloc relativament al mes d'octubre del 2015, en un lloc que, a part de l'entorn evidentment totalment favorable, ens va permetre de nou avançar, avançar en la recerca i és un, un, és un, un honor poder tenir avui aquestes, aquestes actes. Hi van participar més de eh, 30 investigadors de 13 països, 
quan jo sóc alguien en aquest cas sempre hi ha intercanvis lingüístics i culinaris totalment necessaris i vam intentar estructurar, com veureu a través del que és l'índex, la recerca en quatre grans apartats. Un que se centra sobretot en les eines, quines eines podem fer servir per avançar en el que és l'estudi d'aquestes produccions. Un altre és com la dada cronològica i la dada ceràmica pot acabar aportant nova recerca amb unes tradicions ceràmiques realment complexes i àmpliament estudiades per diversos països europeus. Una tercera part, que és pràcticament la recerca en nous processos i manufactures, és a dir, com s'elaboren aquests vasos, les diversitats tècniques i els sabers tecnològics que hi ha a darrere d'aquestes primeres produccions. De fet, no són les més antigues, però són el desenvolupament de la ceràmica que era per aquests moments. I el tercer gran grup és sobre identitats. Com un objecte com és la ceràmica acaba sent una evidència d'un pensament de tipus simbòlic o de tipus identitari, que encara és molt difícil arribar a identificar, però que la portada mateixa ens ho ensenya. Són unes produccions ceràmiques, moltes vegades amb una forta decoració, en aquest cas és una representació de la ceràmica halaf de Tel Halula, i on el simbolisme, però també la representació animalística, faunística, floral, moltes vegades, hi és present. Jo volia ser molt preu amb aquesta... En això segur que una mica podrà complementar la informació. Hi haurà... És un projecte que continua, perquè hi haurà un tercer congrés que se celebrarà a principis de l'any que ve a Turquia, i jo crec que nosaltres hi hem posat la nostra... Hem fet la nostra aportació en aquest sentit. I moltes gràcies per ser aquí per compartir-la i llavors us la podran... Podrà veure una part, la part potser de desenvolupament més simbòlic que té aquest tipus de recerca. Molt bé, bona nit. Jo també seré molt breu amb la presentació. Primer nivell personal, com sempre que parlo en aquesta casa, pel fet d'haver-hi treballat uns quants anys, és un plaer estar aquí. Per tant, agraeixo amb els actuals gestors i i treballadors del Museu d'Arqueologia de Catalunya de Barcelona, l'ajuda que ens estan donant sempre a nivell arqueològic. En aquest sentit, i complementant una mica tant les paraules del doctor Paloma com de la doctora Gómez, jo faria una mencial expressió als dos directors, el director que fa poc ha acabat de ser director, que seria el doctor Josep Rueda, que des del principi va ser molt, d'alguna manera, molt propici a ajudar-nos tant amb la celebració de la taula rodona en aquell moment del workshop el 2015 com de tota la continuïtat del cicle. S'ha de pensar sempre que qualsevol tipus de reunió científica té una rentabilitat molt immediata que seria la presentació de comunicacions i el diàleg i els intercanvis que hi ha entre els investigadors i investigadores, però també hi ha una part posterior que és que quedi alguna cosa fixada de cara a les generacions del futur. Llavors, això des del Museu d'Arqueologia de Catalunya es va entendre molt ràpidament i per tant sí que es va, entre cometes, acceptar que seria un cicle complet, és a dir, el 2015 seria la celebració de l'acte com a vam agafar més el mar d'Empúries, que sempre és molt agradable, però també vam fer dues o tres conferències aquí el primer dia, no sé si us en recordeu, que eren conferències d'abast públic d'alguna manera, i llavors va quedar clar que treballaríem amb la publicació. Per tant, d'alguna manera, aquest cicle complet avui té la cirereta final, que és la publicació d'aquest llibre. I per tant, Rueda, doctor Palomo, el Josep Boia com a actual director, tots molt moltes gràcies per poder-ho fer per poder-ho fer factible. El segon punt que jo volia tractar molt breument i que és un complement a el que s'ha dit fins ara, sobretot per la part de la doctora Gómez, era, diguem-ne, el caràcter internacional. És a dir, diguem-ne, d'alguna manera, nosaltres sí que volem, i jo crec que, diguem-ne, compartim tots els que estem aquí presents a la sala, diguem-ne, i a més, en uns moments convulsos com tenim en aquests moments a la societat catalana, està bé que lluitem per això, però també està bé que la presència internacional estigui el màxim fort i el més potent possible. Llavors, 
Entonces, cada uno, en la mesura de las seves posibilidades, trabajamos para estos objetivos y, de alguna manera, como científicos, intentamos que la representatividad internacional de la, de la, de la investigación que se hace a Cataluña esté presente. Y, por tanto, eso sería una muestra más de esta voluntad, digamos, de, de, en ámbitos diferentes ser presentes. Por tanto, manera, tan a Bruno que ya vi el doctor Cuells dentro de los organizadores por parte de la equipa como aquí que vamos a agafar la responsabilidad de hacer el acto físico y la publicación como probablemente el mes de marzo como decía Elena, el mes de marzo del 2019 que anirem a Antalya, a Turquía pues de alguna manera es la, 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 una de las contribuciones de esta necesidad de la ciencia de intercambio a nivel internacional por último, digamos, agradecer a la tercera persona, que sería el doctor Jörg Berker, la seva presencia aquí y la seva ayuda durante toda la celebración también de este ciclo completo, porque heu visto que ella está dentro de los editores, pero también, més de ser dentro de los editores, va a ser, digamos, miembro organizador de la Coloqui, porque, de alguna manera, volíem precisamente continuar esta tradición de digamos, de interrelación entre diferentes eh, comunidades científicas que permitiesen tirar endavant aquests tipus de acta en aquest sentido. Por tanto, eh, digamos, agradezco, eh? thank you very much, Jörg, for your presence here. Eh, ¿Quién es el doctor Jörg Baker y qué nos hablará hoy? Esto es una mica lo que me han dicho, sobre todo, que yo insisto en este tema, aparte de estas consideraciones más aviat generales y políticas. Jörg Baker es lo que podríamos decir, I speak you in Catalan because you understand very well, no problem. Uh, Jörg Berke sería un representante de la comunidad científica alemana en las campañas del Próximo Oriente. Mientras venía en cap aquí, él me explicaba que la seva primera excavación, you remember the first excavation, first light camp, va ser el LIDAR, que es un jaciment de la edad del bronze que excavaba el seu profesor Haumann eh, en los años 80, ¿no? y eso era la vall de l'Eufrates a Turquía. Desde la seva primera excavación fins ara es un recorregut a la manera alemanya, que es una manera digamos, molt, de molta estada en el terreno de camp, de molta pressió científica, de moltes publicacions, es un món científic digamos, competitiu i potent aquest món de recerca de les universitats alemanya, en que molt sovint, com passa també actualment potser a les universitats espanyoles o catalanes, no podem consolidar la gent fins pràcticament que ja són gairebé seniors de alguna manera, i que llavors tenim el problema aquest. Doncs, aquest món, diguem de competitivitat a Alemanya, el York la petita en primera persona y así es. Entonces, os puc llegir breument en aquests moments es un investigador a la Universitat del Mater, Martin Luther eh, Hall Wittenberg, eh? yeah. Wittenberg de, de, de l'Institut del Pròxim d'Estudis Clàssics d'Alemanya ha fet una recerca molt àmplia tant a Síria que serà, veureu algun dels jaciments de, de, Halaf, el, el jaciment Halaf clàssic, diguem-ne, de la, que va donar nom a la cultura Halaf, doncs ell és el que ha dirigit les excavacions en aquest jaciment, però també té el Tawila, va, va treballar a Turquia en varios jaciments, que jo també us, us citaré, és dir, realment és un home de camp que complementa amb un estudi de laboratori, sobretot de les produccions ceràmiques. I avui ens explicarà les produccions ceràmiques, eh, de Protein Production, del, entre cometes, del sisè mil·leni, y potser una parte del 7 milenio, pero principalmente del 6 milenio, eh? de, de lo que denominem tradicionalmente la cultura halaf, eh? ya veureu que son unas producciones cerámicas de alta calidad, y que de alguna manera siempre hay el debate de técnicas de producciones especializadas, simbolismo de los motivos, una mica las eternas discusiones sobre qué tipo de producciones, porque allá al tener esta calidad tan potente, esta visibilidad y materialidad tan fuerte, digamos, permiten més joc interpretativo. Por tanto, digamos, es interesante o será interesante, yo creo que lo que nos aportará de simbolismo. Pero ¿por qué será más interesante? Porque el, el doctor Jörg Berger va tener, digamos, desde mi punto de vista, la gran sort de trabajar en un jaciment que todos heu sentit a hablar últimamente, que es diu Gobekli Tepe. No sé si heu sentit a hablar, pero la perla actualmente de Orient es Gobekli Tepe, tothom parla de Gobekli Tepe. Entonces, el Jörg, eh, you have the possibility of working in the Gobekli Tepe, ¿no? Fer la fundació, una fundació que posava en contacte els, el món del dels simbolisme a través dels psicòlegs i companyia amb els arqueòlegs. Aquest, aquesta transversalitat pels simbòlegs. Ja hem estat dit, no? 
Ok. Doncs, res, us deixo un moment. Jo crec que, diguem-ne, la doctora Gómez va ser la que va tenir la idea de dir, ostres, el Llorca ens pot fer una cosa molt maca a partir d'aquest tipus de plantejament. Doncs, res, agrair-vos de veritat molt sincerament que estigueu aquí. Diguem-ne, s'agraeix molt que sempre hi hagi gent en el Museu d'Arqueologia de Catalunya quan es fa algun tipus d'acte així. I deixem la paraula al doctor Llorca que ens expliqui les aportacions científiques del sistema. A més, tinc molt bones imatges amb el qual encara ens regalarem una mica. Un moment, on és? Ah, ok. Merci. Sí? Sí. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Miguel, for this um, very kind introduction. Um, I want to speak today about um, some aspects uh, when we are talking um, at, um, about transition um, in the late Neolithic of Upper Mesopotamia, the, um, namely the 7th and 6th millennia BC, not only for the Halaf period itself. The onset of the late Neolithic in Upper Mesopotamia during the early 7th millennium BC, um, so in the first centuries, is represented through the Proto-Hasuna stage, also known after the sites um der Bagir uh, Tel Zotto phase, which evolved out of the innovations of the early Neolithic and is part of a less distinct transformation process than is often believed. During the second half of the seventh millennia, as he has seen on this map, uh, the Hatsuna culture developed in the eastern part of Upper Mesopotamia, so from the northern Tigris region to um, the eastern Khabur Triangle. Similar cultures existed in adjacent regions of the northern, northern Fertile Crescent, so in the Syrian Balikh Valley, in western Syria, Kilikia, or in northwestern Iran. With the formation of the Halaf culture um, from uh, 6,100 until 5,300, the first wide-ranging cultural phenomenon of the late Neolithic appears in which all areas of the northern Fertile Crescent are now, as you can see on the map in um, slide lila, um, part of that culture ranging from the Sacros Mountains in the east close to the Mediterranean Sea um, in the west. Also, this culture appears to be very homogeneous. Regional variations can be observed in different aspects. To show you um, some major shifts and innovations which um, took place um, during the 7th and 6th millennia. Um, we have to see change in location and layout of settlement, appearance of new types of architecture, um, development of pottery into a mass product um, over centuries, that's clear, the introduction of seals and ceilings, shifts in ritual and burial, increase in pastoralism and mobility. And in brackets, um, I have put here the beginning of um, metallurgy. All these um, major shifts and innovations are named after Ackermanns, just with the beginning of metallurgy and its role. I'm a little bit skeptic about that. Taking a look um, by um, some sites, um, of um, characteristics of um, settlement structure and ar architecture um, that's uh, shown on that foley. Um, excavations uh, and surveys document that during the 7th and 6th millennia regions were reoccupied, as you have seen in the example of the Halaf culture, um, after a long time of hiatus, but the settlement density concentrates with regional variations on the rain-fed zone of Upper Mesopotamia. The settlements often consists of some small uh, villages 
often less than one hectare in size, a lot of hamlets and seasonal stations. Um, here left, um, taken some samples from um, the seventh um, millennia, uh, starting in the upper part with um, Umdabagir, for example, south of the rain-fed zone um, lying, which is a good example for a seasonal station um, used for the hunt on onaga and gazelles. Most parts of the settlement are dominated through two blocks of rectangular um, storage buildings with together more than 100 small cells, whereas the smaller living houses are grouped along the southern and western part of the site. Here's a smaller living houses, here these two uh, blocks with these storage rooms. Um, below you see um, Tel Soto in the Sinjar region, which is representing a small hamlet whose buildings consist of circa four to five houses with just uh, 20 to 30 persons. A more um, developed stage of um, such um, late, late Neolithic settlement structure with clearer regulation and house planning is known from the nearby site of Yarim Tepe, number one, where several multi-roomed houses and a communal storage house could be uncovered. Um, to the left um, is shown the example of Bukras along the middle Syrian Euphrates, uh, which represents finally a greater village community, which was continu continuously occupied from the developed early Neolithic PPNB until the late Neolithic, so from about 7,400 until 6,200 BC. The village extends on an area about, uh, of about three hectare. In the younger late Neolithic levels, three to one, with about 180 houses, the site might be inhabited by as many as 700 to 1,000 people. The site suggests a basal pattern of tripartite buildings with streets, open areas, and indicates careful planning. One house mainly consists of three larger rooms for living and two smaller rooms for storage and cooking. As in Umdabagir, most of the houses were plastered and in two of them, wall paintings could be documented which depict, amongst others, ostrich and cranes, or cranes. Showing shortly some examples for the following Halaf um, culture. Um, so we see now that route houses represents uh, the typical houses for living and working during that Halaf period of the early sex millennium. For a long time and based on the state of archaeological research, the Halafian roundhouses were seen as some kind of anachronism and as and seen as evidence for a new secondary stage of sedentism after the end of the early Neolithic, in which a recognition at first took place. But now the emergence of the Halafian roundhouses can be traced back via the older pottery Neolithic into the late PPN B at sites like Akachai Tepe, at Tel Halula, at Tel Zabi Abiyat, um, to mention here the main sites. And in many cases, the buildings can reach the size of later Halafian roundhouses, but very often at these earlier times, they are, um, um, exist um, for in, in one building level um, as a single roundhouse. In the Halaf period, they, become, they became now um, um, the typical living houses. Based on the preceding late Neolithic stages, the Halaf culture is rep represented through a dense settlement system consisting of a few villages occupied for some centuries and a lot of smaller short-living hamlets and seasonal stations. Um, the, latter, the later one also found in long-avoided marginal regions such as Um uh, Xer, for example, or Shams Eddin. Um, with a stronger emphasis on hunting. Following older traditions, several laugh sites are built up of the combination of roundhouses for living and rectangular communal storage um, houses. 
For example, in the case of Tel Zabi Abiyat, that's here in the middle part, um, it is assumed by the excavator that this village represents the combination of people staying there on a year-round basis and transhumant mobile groups. In other cases, small storage rooms are closer connected to the individual living houses, to the toloi, so that the um, layout of the settlement could differ from time to time depending of changes in the local organization and cooperation of such groups. To what extent large sites up to 10 hectares would have existed is at least for the Jazeera, the region between Euphrates and Tigris, doubtful and not really attested. Evidence for ritual buildings well known for the early Neolithic are nearly absent for the late Neolithic small-scale communities. In the following section, I will concentrate not on the material as a whole, but mainly on objects of art, which contain some information about symbolic values and meanings, and which could be partly compared with the early Neolithic representations, asking in which um, part of the archaeological record some older traditions um, may have survived in any form, and giving some clues about traditions and changes between both stages in the long run of human history. For the late Neolithic and Upper Mesopotamia, evidence for symbolism is at best represented in examples of seals, painted pottery, and um, figurines. And I will start here at first with some notes about ceilings. Decoration and ceiling, um, especially of containers made of gypsum, starts during the late pre-pottery Neolithic in the late Pipian Bay, known from Rashamra, Bukras, and Tel El Kumtu, and marks the beginning of Cliptic in the ancient Near East. Traced back to the Natuvian, they seem to originate from decorated beads, amulets, and pendants, while during the Neolithic also stems of clay comes up. But also decorated plaques um, seen on the picture on top, um, left and right, um, and shaft straighteners can be seen as precursors for the later seals, well known for the PPN A sites of Jafel Ahmar, that's the examples upper left, um, Tel Caramel, or partly um, a small plug from uh, Gebekli Tepe. Alongside with geometric motifs, they contain also simplified representations of snakes, vultures, foxes, or scorpions, motifs which partly, at least, occur also on late Neolithic stem seals. Beside a few decorated seals from the Hasuna culture, the cliptic of the, Halaf, of the late Neolithic Halaf period is rooting on that forerunners and experienced a blooming period. Besides the great majority um, of amulet seals of different shapes and button seals, there exists now an increasing amount of sealed clay discs, bulle, labels, and stoppers, which indicates an intensive exchange of goods and their control. Main goal of such sealings, they are shown in, um, in the lower part of that um, figure, um, Main goal of such sealing was to protect the locked goods from unauthorized excess and to mark property. However, a lot of seals may also be worn as personal ornaments on the body or as amulets with um, a magical um, function. The decoration of the seal itself is mostly geometric, but also figural depictions of animals or plants occur. Good examples can be found in more than 300 seal impressions from the burnt village at late Neolithic uh, Sabi Abiyat, here to the left, um, dated around 6100 BC, so proto Halaf period. Most of them were found in small rooms inside large multi room storage buildings where the ceilings were found together with tokens, clay discs, and figurines. It is representing archives open to inspection and control. The size and character of the sealed container suggests that mainly solid, dry products were stored under seal. 
More than 70 seals appear to have been in use simul simultaneously, it tells Zabi Abiyat, indicating that the practice of sealing was in the hands of many people, probably in context of controlled storage. It has been suggested that the sealed sealings facilitated the storage of property belonging to large groups of semi-nomadic people in order to avoid disputes about um, over the ownership or the condition of the stored goods. The seal motifs at Tel Zabi Abiyat display geometric and figural representations, including caprets and motifs often interpreted as plans as well as human depictions. Under the current motifs, we find also a multiple documented design described as zigzag lines in combination with triangles. This motif resembles to the spider motif on pillars um, from the early Neolithic Göbekli Tepe. Although the motif of two sleeves was earlier interpreted as scolopenda. In both cases, the, the depictions obviously tend to indicate their violency and therefore their dangerousness. It seems easy to assume that these animals should have an apotropaic function to protect the locked goods. In a similar manner, also the design of parallel oriented Z S or Z-shaped lines can be seen in tradition in the tradition of the early Neolithic iconography at Göbekli Tepe and other sites as simplified representations of snakes. So Zabi Abiyat marks the earliest well-documented evidence in the Near East for the use of seals and tokens used together in a system to remember and communicate information using some imagery that rooted in the earlier Neolithic tradition. But the sealing practice at Tel Zabi Abiyat was not unique, as recent finds from Einen Kerch, Tel Boe II, and other sites demonstrate. Their distribution is not limited to, lar to um, larger village sites, but found at small isolated hamlets like Tel Boe or Tel Umkseer. While most of the Halafian seals show geometric motifs, cross hatchings, St. Andrew's cross, or other geometrics, one figural seal from the Halaf-related site of Tel Kurdu um, in below right in the Amok region is another example of the recurring motif of, of raptor and prey. Here, a raptor carries off a fish or a snake. Um, taking a look on um, figurines, especially for the Halaf period. Late Neolithic figurines are mostly made of clay, sometimes also of stone or bone. In late Neolithic settlements, they are found in restricted numbers from just a few dozen, uh, a few ones to several dozen at maximum, and a difference to the um, earlier Neolithic. The anthropomorphic figurines are predominantly female figurines out of their representation often labeled as magna mater and assigned with aspects of fertility or lucky charms intended to secure good fortune in childbirth. Their interpretation is also mainly rooted in the depiction itself with exaggerated hips, often holding with their hands their voluminous priests. While some of the female figurines are depicted more naturally, others are made in a more stylized manner, and we can partly observe some regional preferences. Widely distributed are female figurines in seating position with or without some kind of stool. Some female figurines have a vertical hole in the neck partly reaching down to the hip. In these cases, the heads were certainly made of other materials and could be changed if necessary. Sporadic, also some phallus-like objects are known from Kazanehöy, close to Gebekli Tepe, in the Haroran Plain, which resembles to the older and mostly bigger phalloi of Gebekli Tepe itself. Simplified animal figurines are also common, um, where, as most of um, horned um, quadrupeds are interpreted as bulls, but other domesticated spacious um, like sheep and goat or, or dogs are represented as well. 
Human and animal figurines are found in and around houses, often in secondary deposits as rubbish areas or filling layers, where they were disposed after their use. It can be assumed that their use was open to all members of the small communities. Ritual knowledge, knowledge was apparently not limited to specialists, but shared by many, perhaps in specific contexts, such as initiation ceremonies or in ritual associated with birth and death. Following these um, figurines, we could add here sporadic examples of female or animal-shaped vessels um, as seen in this figurine, um, in these pictures, as well as, for example, the flacon um, from Yarem Tepe II, found intentionally bro uh, broken and uh, deposited in a pit as part of a ritual context. Here, another um, um, pieces of such um, zoomorphic and anthropomorphic vessels. Uh, coming to halaf pottery. Um, in general, during the 7th and 6th millennia, we observe that pottery decoration become more and more important, resulting in the 6th millennia to halaf, into halafian assemblages with about 80% of uh, painted pottery. The vast majority of this painted pottery shows a geometric design in which different motifs are grouped together and decorates the main part of such vessels more or less completely, often framed through horizontal and or vertical bands. In much lesser quantity, also persons, animals or architecture is depicted. Most archaeologists would agree into the opinion that decoration is not simply an ornament, but could be used to submit ideas and or to express membership to a group or separation, so creating identity. Regarding painted pottery of the Halaf period, um, we may see important difference between the dominating geometric motives and the fewer naturalistic decorations. But both are used in social contexts with an active set of meanings that could relate to personal histories, storytelling, or, and or to mythologies. But it's clear um, that it's um, very um, difficult um, to do here such interpretations. Uh, at first, I want to show, uh, give you an impression about the range um, of um, the animal motifs at first. Um, in the upper um, row you see um, typical um, representations of uh, Bukranya, then um, followed by mouflons, deers, gazelles, mountain goats and onaga. Uh, nearly all of them were hunted as part of the subsistence um, for the well-known uh, Bukranya, it is not so clear, but very likely that also these Bukranya on the painted pottery um, mainly represent wild animals. All other um, on the Halaf pottery um, painted um, animals are clearly wild. To the right, I've um, um, put there a photo. Um, for comparisons um, with the um, representation um, in low relief on, of a book, book Rania on a pillar from the much more older Göbekli Tepe. Other wild animals are leopards, cheetahs, fish, snakes, and different species of bird, birds often very stylized and difficult to be identified. But we can see an, uh, an owl, we can see storks, a goose, flamingos, and vultures. Um, here to the left, I show you um, in um, terms of um, maybe tradition, um, for example, uh, a row of leopards, and below um, a similar um, um, leopard with uh, 
dotted uh, skin on a plug uh, from Del uh, Bucras. Um, in the lowest part, there is uh, then from the Halaf period, uh, maybe a fox-like um, animal depicted here um, in um, um, the upper um, shoulder of that vessel. To the right um, below, there is a cheetah um, from um, Yarim Tepe II painting on Halaf pottery. And um, um, on top of it, um, a pillar with um, a raptor from uh, Göbekli Tepe. Um, in a few cases, um, we know um, some hunting scenes depicted here, for example, in the upper part um, in a, um, on a unique bowl from Upper Chia. You see here in the inside painting this hunting scene on deer and bull. Um, the hunter itself is... Um, um, has um, a bow in his hand, and uh, below I have um, used one example of the uh, well-known um, wall paintings from um, late Neolithic uh, Chatalhöyk for uh, comparisons. Um, as said before, um, birds um, representing numerically a um, large group of um, depicted um, animal species on halaf pottery. Often they are very st stylized to be identified, but in other cases they are extremely naturalistic. Identifiable species include stork, flamingo, owl, vulture, ducks, and um, geese. The attractivity of birds can be easily explained as in difference to us humans, nearly all of them cannot only swim in, in the water or walking on the earth, but flying um, um, through the air. Um, also, for the comparison with older traditions, I show you to the left um, the um, singular uh, representation of an owl, or oh, wrong thing, uh, to the left uh, from Yarim Teppe. Um, sides, Yarim Tepe 2, and uh, to, to the right, a small uh, stone um, figurine uh, exca um, interpreted by the excavator also as owl from the PPNA side of Jaf El Ahmar. Uh, to the right, I have grouped together um, some depiction of snakes um, um, from Halaf pottery um, and be sure that you uh, most of you have um, in mind that um, snakes um, are very well represented in the um, early Neolithic, not only at Gebekli, but at uh, a lot of other sites. Um, here are some depictions, uh, for example, of um, rapture birds, uh, often interpreted as vultures from different sides to the right, um, a vulture on a relief from Göbekli Tepe. Um, I will um, in, um, very soon come back to vultures, but uh, we, t we have to uh, put in here a short look on uh, human representations. Um, what you see here on this um, plate are um, um, representations of the motive of um, the so-called dancing ladies, um, which is very common during the early stages of the Halaf period around 6000, and um, which was influenced by the Sasan um, Samara culture. In um, these uh, motives, um, you see a row of strongly stylized human figurines making a round dance. They're often depicted on the inside of um, bowls and uh, plates. And in its wider context, such depictions from the Neolithic of the Near East, especially for the late Neolithic times, are often seen 
as expressions of feasts and dance in the background of more egalitarian societies. More naturalistic human depictions are just represented in minimal quantities, showing these persons in different activities and contexts, partly again um, in dancing scenes, often with sustained head, and sometimes long heard. Um, here you see on top um, to the right human heads on the exterior of a vessel from Domostepe, on the interior to the left um, we can recognize a quadruped with dotted skin, maybe again a leopard. Below left I have um, used for comparison here a human head from a wall painting of late Neolithic Chatal Hoek and to the below right a human head in high relief from the early Neolithic Göbekli Tepe, but it should be mentioned that flat stone reliefs uh, are also known from Göbekli Tepe um, and also um, when they are ordering human heads uh, in rows. Furthermore, the example from Domus Tepe above also resembles to small stone masks of the early Neolithic, known, for example, from Gebekli Tepe, Jafet Ahmar, or Nevalichori. Um, most interesting here um, is, for me, the uh, fragmented piece of a jar labeled Death Pot from Domus Tepe with a narrative scene. Reading from left to right, a uh, uh, tree, apparently headless human bodies, splayed flat on the ground and surrounded by standing birds. At the right follows a partly preserved standing figure facing away from the bodies to the right. The large standing figure may be closed and holds something in his hand. Shown in profile, he has a slightly elongated head. It is important to note that similar other shirts have been discovered at Domus Tepe that portray heads separate from their bodies. In analogy with these depictions, the circular object behind um, the figure um, may be um, a head with a top knot. It means this here. Of course, the depiction of headless persons is well known, again, from the late Neolithic side of Chatal Hoek, especially from the so-called sanctuary of vultures, where vultures with spread wings flying above headless human, um, humans, it has dead persons. If such a depiction is portraying a scene with real existing vultures, seem to be questionable. In an interesting paper 15 years ago, um, Russell McGowan um, had um, reconstructed um, out of um, bird wing bones um, the ritual dance of the crane in which humans are dressed up as cranes as shown here in this um, um, figure, in this reconstruction. And uh, in that sense, um, not a typical representation of a crane is shown uh, from people in Bay, um, A layers at Gebekli Tepe, um, and which uh, were published by the excavator Klaus Schmidt several years ago. Below a cattle and a fox, a crane is depicted, but the crane has very human-like legs with knees, bird legs, has to go backwards. Um, and an impressive combination of humans and birds of prey, here maybe once again a vulture on top of two human heads, is well known on a composite figure um, made of limestone from the PPNB site of Neville Chori, uh, found in the, um, in the sanctuary there. Older depictions of an itifallic headless human person is again known from um, Gebekli Tepe here on pillar 43. Um, the human figure um, below right on this pillar is part of a dense sequence of images consisting of birds of prey and other birds, four-legged animals, snakes, and a scorpion. 
as example for the long tradition in the burial re record, um, I show here finally the grave of a circa 45-age-old woman buried in the cave of Hilason Tachtit in northern Israel. Dated to the Natufian, circa 10,750 BC, the woman was buried with tortoise shell and on her right arm the wing of an eagle. Um, the grave was interpreted as shaman burial, and it has to be mentioned that the similar burials, often using wings of birds of prey, eagles, vultures, bastards, but also other animals, foxes and others, are known from a lot of sites in the Near East, um, from the Epipaleolithic onwards, so from Kfar Akil in the Lebanon, the Shanida graves, in the Sacros Mountain, but also from caves and sites in uh, Europe. To um, come to an end, um, the iconography of the early Neolithic is mainly characterized through depictions of the wild, often dangerous animals, as humans at this time just stood at the very beginning of the transformations which lead to agriculture and animal husbandry. Dominating are therefore depiction of birds of prey, predators, wild bears, wild pigs, snakes, foxes, scorpions, um, and so on, which are found not only portrayed at special buildings at different sites, but also on different objects combined in different ways, but could be f found widely distributed. This widely distributed prehistoric um, world was in recent contributions often seen as an example for an external storage of information, or in other words, as an early Neolithic sign system whose symbols and narratives to read we are still in process. A slightly different world we observe in the late Neolithic of Upper Mesopotamia. So often depicted <coughs> Bukranya on the Halafian vessels maybe still represent wild cattle, while caprits and others on the seals and ceilings mostly re represent domesticated animals. To a lesser quantity, depictions are still existing, which resembles to early Neolithic pictures, and also partly establishing ties to Anatolia, especially to the iconography known from Chetalhöik. While the absolute quantities is not so relevant, some good examples from Thomas Teppe, as um, at best the <coughs> despot, sorry, tells us that special narratives were repeated again and again and had for their users a special and important meaning. In many other cases, it is not so easy to give clear interpretations of meaning, function and use of such depictions. And we must be aware that motives and their meanings were new interpreted and fit into existing frameworks and sorts of thoughts and ideas. <clears throat> Probably the simpler geometric as well as the narratives ones were part of some kind of mythological or belief systems, in which also the changing role between humans and animals, um, humans in the late Neolithic now as dominating on animals and plants, were depicted, while other themes may be related to death and life. However, the background of their depictions for the late Neolithic is a sedentary life with farming and animal husbandry. But also as long as hunting still existed, the conflict with the wild was still present and you transformed through long-living oral traditions. It will remain impossible for us to know what the early or late Neolithic communities themselves thought about their animal and human representations, because only the archaeological record uh, had survived to us. But I have tried to show you on through some selected examples that different types of birds 
for example, played an important role in some kind of mythological um, and belief systems, as especially um, vultures. It should make us also clear that human life, so life of Homo sapiens as spacious, was from the very beginning more than daily life, more than just to look on subsistence um, and other more profane things. We are not only social human beings, but <clears throat> trying um, to find our role in our communities, explaining the world um, and our role therein, not only today, but also in the past. Thank you for your attention. Algú té alguna pregunta, qüestió? Suposo que tots ens en venen al cap, no?, amb aquest imaginari que ens ha presentat. De fet, cronològicament hem anat oscil·lant una mica endavant, un revent, no és exactament sisè mil·leni, però sí que jo crec que el Llorc ha triat aquelles imatges que ens podrien ajudar més a entendre un procés que és llarg i complex, com és aquest món del simbolisme associat a tot mena d'objectes i productes, i on sempre el món de les aus hi és present, però també el món de les representacions animalístiques, bàsicament quadrúpeds, però com ell ha comentat, en unes societats que ja són agricultores, ramaderes, i on la representació principal encara és, o és, salvatge, d'espècies salvatges. Us animo a fer-li alguna pregunta en concret. Ningú? Sí. Un moment, un moment. que he vist una creu que és molt semblant a aquelles creus que portaven els alemanys a la Luftwaffe, les creus de ferro. M'ha semblat molt semblant. No sé si té... què pot dir d'això? Home, el que sabem és que els neolítics no ens van inspirar amb els... Això per descomptat, no? Però m'ha sorprès. En la representació ceràmica Halaf també hi ha el motiu esbàstica, a vegades també la fan. Això mateix. Ok. Ok. It's not so easy. I would I would see it as a as part of the geometric motifs, and it is clear in 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 a lot of parts with pictures. We must be careful to say to interpret it, and we have our biggest difficulties to understand. Um, what also the whole scene want to show us. In other cases, it's more or less clear. We have a Pukramia, we have a scorpion, we have a snake, mm -hmm. we have some crosses and others. Um, and uh, on the other side, you have a big vessel with two uh, human figurines. But what the story in general wants to tell us, uh, it's very, to me, it's at least actually difficult to say. Mm. I have just point, uh, picked out here um, this, uh, this hunting scene, which is uh, relatively clear in its interpretation as the representation of a hunting. Uh, and want to show, in this case, the comparison uh, to Anatolia. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Bueno, ahora se hacen. Ah, de acuerdo. Bueno, yo te has de decir que no he antes mucha cosa, pero que yo al me bueno, en cara no he arriba tal nivel de expertise, pero sí que hay alguna cosa que me que me sorprende. Ahora. 
Bueno, yo ya... Eh, me sorpresa el tema de los bultones que... Para decirlo así, eh, no acabo de entender muy bien si esta tienda de capitales eh, es una representación de un conflicto en la natura o es potser un conflicto en otros grupos humanos, porque cuando mira aquí algún tipo de conflicto veig. no sé si me podría aclarir. Sí, aquí. Aquí y también el anterior. El fet de que estiguin de capitales me ha ¿no? Eso supongo que yo sea, això algún tipo de conflicto, pero no sé si es una relación de la natura o amb, o amb altres grupos sociales. Is, um, um, if I see it correctly, um, um, I have it not yet uh, actually checked um, what's by the new excavations, um, um, how, how it was um, through the new, new excavations by Ian Hodder, but I know from the old excavation Mallard describes clear that um, there is no decapitation found on the human bones, um, though he has and uh, also at his time, um, he was very skeptical if this depiction is a real scene which took place, or is that some kind of mythological scenario. And um, in other cases, as I have um, con con contrasted, um, when I have put it here um, directly behind, was an article uh, by Russell McGowan uh, about 15 years ago. Um, you can uh, find it also in the internet. And where they um, reconstructed from um, uh, crane wings, which were found um, not, as, uh, not as part of um, eating um, um, in Chatalhoek, um, and have also made a survey of similarities in other sites and other periods um, that they uh, came to the conclusion and um, to reconstruct a crane and also with crane symbolism also other uh, colleagues um, were working and um, maybe crane with um, um, and um, um, their their um, um, Crans or dance of the crane uh, goes more in the direction uh, dance of life and um, then um, maybe if we see that also um, um, that it's um, not impossible that um, maybe also um, a, a crane of vulture would have once existed and I've in the um, latest picture just to come, come and I have um, um, shown you this um, um, female grave um, of the Nat Natufian, uh, sh um, showing you that there is a long tradition of these um, burials where you find especially uh, eagles, vultures, mm -hmm. uh, raptor birds connected with human um, burials. Mm -hmm. And it was in, in this uh, cave, it was a special cave. Um, it, it was a special gra a grave. Um, there were other graves, um, but uh, without such, um, but without such uh, um, um, wings or things else. Alguna pregunta més? Algun dubte? Ja retera després a Josep Miquel. Siempre se, siempre, se, siempre se les representa sobre una superficie o también volando, porque, es que es por la porque muchas imágenes salen como encima de superficies, o sea, si sale vol, salen representaciones de, de volando o no. Las representaciones de rapiñairas o vas a decir las figuras humanas, 
Els ocells. Els ocells a vegades apareixen, ja t'avanço, <laughs> descansant, a vegades assentats, a vegades sembla que això, eh, que estiguin en posició de repòs, a vegades a l'aigua, i la majoria de vegades estan com volant, estan en, fent una acció. I llavors els representen amb tot tipus de suports, eh? des de ceràmica, amb aquest suport parietal a les cases, no? que formen part de la decoració. Però potser el teu un comentari més... Also, for example, we, um, birds are very f um, frequent. We found them in different um, um, compositions, um, often um, um, in rows, um, uh, or in um, larger groups, um, drinking, swimming. Um, so, um, um, and it's um, partly they are also so um, depicted that you cannot really um, identify uh, which uh, species um, was presented here. Um, so, as far as I see, there is no clear thing which we can handle um, um, today with. Um, I want to, just to, to show um, some possibilities in the case of vultures and their role they played in um, reality with death human persons um, and not to follow each um, bird representation. Uh, pots preguntar-li, si us plau, si pensa que podria haver-hi com una mena de protoscriptura? És a dir, que, que el fet de la decoració fos com un llenguatge unificat o no unificat, no ho sé, entre diferents llocs? Vull dir que fos una forma de comunicació entre diferents llocs, Halaf i anteriors, bé, bueno, posteriors. No és una escriptura, eh? Bueno, d'acord, tens raó. Però vull dir que expliqués la partida del simbolisme, o sí. Sigui, que hi hagués com que s'expliquessin històries o alguna cosa d'aquest tipus. I would say, um, especially with a painting, it's clear To me, um, it's uh, um, some kind of um, um, to build um, identities. Um, we can, um, at least on a um, um, geographic um, basis, um, um, see that um, special types Um, to use um, typical ornaments on special vessel shapes um, are um, preferred, for example, in the Rabur region. Others, um, though, um, some kind of re regional variation, which is um, what is often a little bit difficult, um, that in older publications it was um, not um, or, or seldom quantified. Um, so what is really typical? Is it um, a singular piece or is it, um, or, or have we 200 which are made? Um, um, several scholars have um, also um, discussed um, at, at least um, geometric uh, or, or in general also um, ornamental um, structures Um, compared from different regions um, in the Halaf period. And um, um, in general, also, I would agree that these ornaments, um, made them um, geometrics or um, figural, uh, were used uh, or, or could be used to identify, um, to make, um, to show membership. We are belong um, to that uh, group. Um, 
and uh, in some times it's, had, it, it's a little bit difficult from the old lit literature um, to see that. Yeah. Of if that um, um, I s for the, at least for the pottery, I see no um, um, clear um, point um, that it should be any kind of writing, but um, other forms of communication and ag agreement, um, building groups and identities, and also vice versa um, separations. So much. Alguna pregunta més? Algun dubte? Allà, sí. La Cristina. Um, what do you think about uh, family figurines? Can we talk about Venus, matriarchal culture? What is your opinion? Um, my opinion is that they were used in um, um, rituals, for example. Um, um, and that in an actual recent article, which shall be printed next time, um, I have it described and followed um, older um, interpretations by Uko or uh, Mary Voigt for Chattal Hoek, that they, in my opinion, were mainly used um, as magic vehicles. Um, but um, we should not forget that um, their role must not be um, seen in one part. I can also not exclude it that it, in other uh, that some pieces were um, used by childs, yeah? so child tools, uh, toys. But I think the main um, to describe is uh, um, for me they are um, surely not uh, goddess-like figurines. Because normally goddess um, or gods, you don't de uh, destroy it so easily. Um, so I would prefer to say that these were magic vehicles, which could be easily uh, made by nearly everybody. And um, after um, the ritual was done, um, could be broken. Okay, thank you. Alguna pregunta més? Dubte? Si no, donaríem la paraula al director del museu, el Josep Boya, que amablement ens acull. Ja. <laughs> Bona nit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Becker. Uh, the Museum of Archaeology of Catalonia is very happy uh, having you today here. Eh? Bé, um, aquest és un llibre important. Eh? És un llibre important per moltes raons. Eh? Una perquè amb els tensos que vivim de l'Estar System dels museus, eh? els museus se'n jutgen pel nombre de visitants que fem, eh? les cues que hi ha a la porta. I eh, es deixa de costat eh, dos de les funcions importants d'un museu. Eh? Una és la conservació d'un patrimoni, garantir que aquest patrimoni passarà a les generacions futures amb les condicions d'integralitat eh? doncs amb la que les hem rebut. I la segona és el coneixement sobre aquest patrimoni. Eh? Vivim tensos que és difícil reivindicar el valor de la recerca en els museus, eh? però ho hem de fer-ho. Eh? Ho hem de fer-ho i ho hem de fer-ho amb convicció. I hem d'apostar per aquests instruments de difusió de la recerca. Sobretot quan aquests instruments suposen un treball cooperatiu que va més enllà de les fronteres del nostre país. I jo crec que aquest és un dels valors d'aquest treball. I és una de les apostes que aquest museu ha fet des de fa temps i que el temps que jo hi sigui continuarem fent. Continuarem fent. És a dir, a l'integrar el coneixement sobre la nostra realitat històrica, fer-la també amb un marc molt més global, Eh? perquè finalment els museus del segle XXI són museus que parlen més que de les identitats, parlen de les persones humanes, eh? del gènere humà. 
i aquest parlar sobre la naturalesa humana necessita aquests treballs de visió comparativa, aquestes visions molt més globals. Per tant, no és una centricitat que el Museu d'Història de Catalunya dediqui una publicació a parlar del Neolític al Pròxim Orient. És una necessitat, és un acte de responsabilitat. I des d'aquest punt de vista, jo celebro aquesta edició, vull agrair a totes les persones que hi han participat, tant de Catalunya com d'altres països, vull agrair també especialment al personal de la casa, al Toni Palomo, que ha tingut molta cura d'aquesta edició, i bé, i és dir-vos que és el número 1 d'una nova línia de monografies del MAC, que esperem que ben aviat en tindrem una altra, que abordarà també aquestes temàtiques amb visió internacional, amb visió comparativa, que penso que a mi m'agradaria fossi un dels lemes d'aquesta casa. Aquest és un museu sobre Catalunya, però és un museu obert al món. I és amb aquesta dialèctica Catalunya-món que el treball científic agafa una perspectiva i una importància molt gran. I sempre he reivindicat la idea també de defendre l'aportació catalana, l'aportació científica catalana a la cultura universal. Bé, això necessita d'instruments com aquests, d'instruments amb altres llengües, i necessita un treball de col·laboració com s'ha fet amb aquest d'això. Per tant, molt honorat que hagi volgut acceptar col·laborar amb aquesta edició i sabeu que aquesta és la vostra casa per continuar fent aquest tipus d'iniciatives.